So we'll look at Genesis 1-1 again, in the beginning. Now I wanted to call this sermon in the beginning, but then I had a quick look. I already called one of my sermons before in the beginning. So what I decided to call it today is in the beginning God created. The title for the sermon this morning is God created. We're looking at creation of heaven and earth here. But I want you to notice that straight away in verse number 1, it says in the beginning. Now was there a beginning before the beginning? No. In the beginning means this is the creation of time. Okay, and you know what is generally known, I've heard this said many times and it's true, the only way anything can exist is if at the same time you have time, space and matter. You need all three elements in order for anything in this world to even exist. And here we have in the beginning, so God creates time, it says God created heaven, that's space, and then it says and the earth, that's matter. Time, space and matter all created at this one time. Now, it's very important the Bible says here, created the heaven. Now, a lot of your modern translations, your new international version, the new King James, the ESV, instead of saying heaven there, it says heavens, plural. Okay? That causes a problem for the rest of this chapter. Because as we look through this chapter, uh, let's, let's have a look. Look at verse number 7. Look at verse number 7. It says, And God made the firmament, okay, now, what is the firmament? Look at verse number 8. And God called the firmament heaven. Say, so what in the world? So if God already created heaven in verse number 1, but then we see in verse number 7 He creates heaven again, what's going on here? Well, we'll understand shortly that God creates a different, uh, or He divides the heaven into three. He divides the heaven into three. But you have a problem if you have these new, new versions, say heavens already, He creates the heavens already, then what is He dividing if there's already a number of heavens? That's number one. But the question quite often gets asked, you know, especially by, by the atheists or people that, you know, uh, don't know their Bibles, they might say, well, what did God do? What, what, what was, before God created the heaven and the earth, what was God doing for millions of years before, you know, while He was in heaven, what was He doing for millions of years? Well, there was no millions of years. There was no heaven. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. That means before that, it's God. Okay? Now, this is hard for us to wrap our minds around. We know that God is eternal. We know He's always been and He always will be. We know Jesus Christ says He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, in, in the end right? That's what Jesus Christ says. It's, it's, it's much easier for us to understand eternity to come because, you know, we're, we're stuck in time, right? We, we see we're moving forward in time. So we, we can understand the concept of there being a, a never-ending journey for us in heaven. For all eternity. It never ends. It never stops. But it's hard to understand that it never ended. It never began, or in a sense, for God. Now, God created the beginning. God created time. But see, God is outside of time. What was He doing for millions of years before that? There was no millions of years. How do I explain that? I can't. Because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a physical human being that, that is, uh, since I've been born into this world, I'm a, I understand time. I understand that time moves. Okay? But to understand eternity past is very difficult for the mind to comprehend. And I love it. I love the fact that it's very difficult. In fact, I'd say it's impossible for our minds to fully comprehend because that's, that's the God that we worship. Isn't it great to know that the God that we worship is beyond our human, you know, limited understanding? Because if, if we could contain Him in our minds, He wouldn't be much of a God. You know, now, the reason we know God is because of what He tells us in His Word. We can stand firm in what He tells us in His Word, but it's amazing to know that it's internal being without any beginning. It's hard, it's hard for us to grasp our minds around, it, minds around it, but it's great because that makes Him worthy of worship. It makes Him that great God that we worship. I, I, I love the God of the Bible. I love that we can worship a God that has no beginning Himself. All right? Now, uh, I'm going to read. If you guys can just keep your finger there, turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And while you're turning to John 1, I'm going to read to you from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10. It says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. You see, the reason God created all things is for his own pleasure. We'll look at that later on. But is that we can, we can see the work of his hands, the work of God. You know, as you see the beautiful coastlines here, you know, the beautiful oceans, the beautiful trees, the mountains, you know, the hills, just everything that you can see in creation. 
You know, you know from, the, from the large things like stars and planets and, and the things that orbit the earth, that's amazing. But even to the tiny little details, you know, the smallest atoms are, are, are amazing. The way the little organisms work, the little things. Brother Sam was telling me about these microorganisms that live in the soil and, and how they work. I mean, to just understanding those little things, you know, just, just shows us the amazing works of God's hands. But look at John 1.1. This is important because it, it kind of sounds very similar to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, did this Word ever have a beginning? No. It says here, the same was in the beginning with God. He was already there. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And this, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the first thing we need to understand you know, and that becomes quite clear in the book of Genesis, is that God is more than one person. Now, we don't see that immediately when we read the first verse there. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But we, what we see here with John 1.1, 1, 1, it was that it was the Word of God that created all things. And that Word of God was Jesus Christ. And we know that Jesus Christ takes the instruction and does the will of God the Father. And so it was God's the, God the Father's will to create all things and he did that through his son. I'm going to read it to you from Revelation 4.11 because the question gets asked, well, why did God create? What was the purpose behind that? It says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, in Revelation 4.11, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Why did God create? For his pleasure. You see, God found it, it pleased him to create all things. He finds joy. He finds satisfaction. You know, it satisfies the Lord to create, to show the works of His hands. That's why He created all things. And that means you have a purpose. If God created you, you know, for His pleasure, you have a purpose in His, in His will. He wants you to know Him. He wants you to walk in His paths. He wants you to keep His commandments. He wants you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. He wants to spend all eternity with you forever. It's, it's great to know that you know, life is not an accident. It's not just a big bang and just things fell into place by accident. You know, we have no purpose. When you die, that's all that's left of you. You just fertilize the grass. No, it's beautiful to know that the God, the creator of all things that we cannot fully comprehend, loves us so much that he's given us a purpose, that it pleases him to have created us. And he wants to have that walk and fellowship with you. Go back to Genesis 1 verse 2. Genesis 1 verse 2. Because now we see the third person of the Trinity here. It says, And the earth was without form and void. That means basically it was empty. It wasn't complete. Okay? And darkness was upon the face of the deep. So we see darkness there. And the Spirit of God, there's the Holy Spirit, moved upon the face of the waters. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing that we see just from the beginning of creation. All three persons of the Godhead are there, right? All three persons of the Trinity. We see the Spirit of God moving upon the face of the water. So how did God create the earth? Well, it was completely dark. You know, it was, it was without form and void, and void. It was empty. And there was waters. You know, so God created water on day one as well. The uh, whole earth was, was covered by, by the waters. Verse number three. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And this should show us just the power of God. That he can just speak things into existence. God just says, let there be light. You know, and there it is. There's light. <laughs> you know, everything that God creates is subject unto him. Everything that God creates obey, obeys him. You know, and that's what we see when Jesus Christ is, is on that ship and, he, and he's able to just calm the seas just by speaking. You know, that's the same power that we see of God in creation here. He just speaks and it is. It's God's will. Verse number four, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Now, I want you to notice in verse number four, the kind of God that we worship. You see, the God that we worship divides light from darkness. You know, God likes to have distinct things. You know, he wasn't satisfied with just the darkness there on the earth. He creates light to differentiate from the darkness, okay? See, God is a God of distinctions. God is someone that likes things black and white. Okay, just a clear division between certain elements. Now, what I want you to see, notice there in, in uh, just the fact that God created light, 
I'll just, uh, you don't need to turn there. I'm just going to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, because there is a spiritual element to this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, that's that creation, have shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, the, the, the spiritual lesson here of God creating light in darkness is so we can see that we were once in darkness. We once did not have the light of Jesus Christ in our lives. We once did not have the light of the gospel. But in the same way that God creates light from darkness or He speaks light into existence, is the same thing for us, guys. When we, when we get saved, the, the light of Christ shines in our hearts. We become children of light. We become children of God. And that differentiates us from the world. It differentiates us from darkness. So should we then walk in darkness when we're children of light? Of course not. We should walk in the light that, that Christ shines, right? That light is given to us in His Word. He, he shines the light so we can walk in His paths. Just as, as much as it's God wanted light to differentiate from the darkness, He wants us children of light to be different from this world, this world of darkness. Genesis chapter 1 verse 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness He called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So just a couple of things here. You know, we see God continue to, to divide. Now He creates day and night because of the light, okay? He creates day and night. And it says, in the evening and the morning were the first day. So it's, it's quite interesting, and, and this is something you'll probably notice as you read your Bibles, is that we think of our days kind of like we, we, from midnight, right? Midnight is the start of a new day, okay? And, and in a sense, we kind of think of morning as the beginning of the day. We get up in the morning, and then the sun sets. Uh, but actually, the way God sees days, He starts with the evening, okay? So when the sun sets, that's the point of the new day. And, you know, that's the way uh, the Israelites would, would look at days in the Bible. So if you, if you ever find it difficult to understand days in the Bible, you know, keep that in mind. That's how God sees days. It's the evening when the sun sets, and, you know, we're evening time. That's the start of the new day until that cycle repeats, okay? So evening and then the morning were the first day. That's how God sees uh, days. Verse number six. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. So we see that Christ here, or God here, is creating a division of waters, okay? And what is this firmament? You know, it's not that hard to understand. We'll have a look at it soon. But it says in verse 7, And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Do you get the picture here that, that God's really interested in division? You know, distinctions. Very important in His creation. Verse 8, and God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Say, so, well, hold on, Pastor Kevin. Didn't God already create heaven? Didn't we see that in verse number one? Yeah, but now we see by the division of waters, He's created a division of heavens. Okay, a division of heavens. And, you know, the Bible, uh, not the Bible. <laughs> I looked this up and I already preached on this. But apparently, and I don't know how they worked this out. But apparently there's 142 million billion liters of water in our atmosphere, okay? 142 million billion liters of water in our atmosphere. And I don't know if this is 100% correct, but I've, I have looked at this and I couldn't, I couldn't find the reference, but I remember reading this, that if all that water in the atmosphere just fell, if God just did a supernatural thing and all the water, of course, the clouds, but not just the clouds, just in our atmosphere, if it all just fell on the earth, that it would cover every mountain, that there, there wouldn't be any dry land in place if all that water fell. And so we see how God creates this division. He has water on the earth, but He also has water up in the sky. And uh, I've heard some people say that, I don't know, I hope it's, I mean, I don't, it, I, if it's you, I'm not upset with you, don't worry about it. But I've heard people say the firmament is this hard dome in the sky. You know, some people believe in a you know, flat earth. But even, even some people that don't believe in flat earth, they believe in global earth, they believe that there was this dome, you know, this glass dome of, of water in the sky. But we see that God calls the firmament heaven. And why that's important is because in, uh, in verse number 20, just look at verse number 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open 
firmament of heaven. So where are these birds flying? In the sky, in the heaven, not in a glass dome. They're not flying inside a glass dome, okay? They're flying in the sky, and I know they're not flying in a glass dome because then they land on the earth. They land on the trees. I see birds every, every day, right? So they're flying in the heaven, meaning they're flying in the sky. They're flying in that first heaven. And even, even in Spanish, you know, in Spanish, um, to say the word sky is the word cielo. Is it the same in, in, in Tagalog, cielo? You guys use the same word? No? That's okay. But the word heaven in Spanish, you know what that is? Cielo. The same word. Cielo. It's where we get the word ceiling from. Okay? Ceiling. Cielo. It's the same thing. Sky and heaven in Spanish, we use the same words. And we see God here describing the sky where the birds fly as heaven. The same words as where His throne is. All right? Verse number nine. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and the dry land appear, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. So again, we see God creating another division. Now He separates the waters on the earth, and He allows dry land to appear. Again, a God that divides, a God that wants distinction between waters and dry land. Verse number 10, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called His seas, and God saw that it was good. Alright, so just, that, just a reminder there, God continues making clear distinctions and divisions. Verse number 11, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yield in seed, and the fruit tree yield in fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yield in seed after his kind, and the tree yield in fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. So what does God do on the third day? He creates all kinds of, you know, uh, grass and, and vegetation and, and, and uh, yeah, just, just uh, trees and all those kinds of things appear on the third day. But what I want you to just point your, uh, your focus there, guys, and I've covered this before, is that you see that the fruit tree yields fruit after his kind. And the seed itself, or the grass, the herb, brings forth after its own kind. Another truth of God's order, of God's creation, is that everything produces after itself. Okay? Here we see a physical rep rep reproduction. Okay? If you want an apple tree, what are you going to do? You're going to plant a, 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 an orange seed to grow an apple tree? No, you, you, to, to grow an apple tree, you're going to need to plant that apple seed. Right? Well, whatever plant you want, you need to make sure you take the seed of that plant and guaranteed, according to God's Word, it's going to reproduce after its own kind. Alright? Human beings, when we have children, we reproduce human beings, don't we? After our own kind. When dogs reproduce, they reproduce, reproduce dogs after their own kind. And what I want to explain to you here, this is common sense. You know, every scientist, scientific test proves this. You can go to your backyard and, and put whatever seed you want in your backyard and you'll see scientific proof that everything produces after its own kind. But what theory is out there contrary to creation? What theory is being taught in our public school systems? Evolution. What does evolution teach? That everything is reproduced from the same kind. That's, you know, that within the waters, you know, millions of, whatever it is, sorry if I got it wrong, you know, millions of years ago, you know, uh, all these, you know, uh, Chemicals got together, formed its first organism, some single cell organism in the water that became eventually some jellyfish or something. Eventually that, that fish went onto dry land and grew legs and then that became a rodent and then that rodent became a monkey and here you are guys. You know, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for that. You know, everything produces after its own kind. That means your grandfather is not a jellyfish. Okay, your grandfather is not some cockroach. You know, the apes, the, the monkeys, they're not your ancestors. Amen. All right? They're not. They don't reproduce after... I mean, they do reproduce after their own kind. Okay? They don't reproduce humans. You don't see a dog giving birth to a little baby boy. Okay? It doesn't happen. God's Word is truth. All right? It's amazing. And we call them scientists. We call them lecturers in our, in our, in our, in our colleges. We call them teachers. We give them all these names and they teach such stupidity, such nonsense that anybody can prove, anybody can do th these experiments and know that everything reproduces after its own kind. 
And this is important. This is important because as we go into the, into, uh, uh, later in the later chapters of Genesis, eventually we're going to get to Genesis chapter 6. And there's a, there's a really foreign teaching out there that, that, t- that uh, teaches that, you know, angels, fallen angels and human ladies reproduced and created giants. You know, we'll cover that when we get to Genesis chapter 6. But I want you to remember chapter 1, okay? Everything reproduces after its own kind. And if you can believe that truth, then you'll know what I believe about Genesis 6, okay? Because if something else is reproducing that are not the same kind and reproducing something that's not their kind, then we're breaking the laws that God has given us in creation, all right? We'll have a look at that later on when we get there. Uh, but verse number 14, actually, no, let's, not, let's keep going there. So spiritually, spiritually speaking, if we want to see people get saved, if we want people to believe on Christ, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Do we need to drop a, a, a church tract in the letterbox? Is the church tract going to reproduce after its own kind? A church tract might reproduce another church tract, okay? But what's required of us is to go and knock those doors, preach the gospel as a saved person, and then we can reproduce after our own kind, can't we? Okay? A piece of paper is not going to get someone saved. It might get them curious. It might get them asking questions. Hey, it might even close the deal for them. It might get them, yes, I believe this, because someone has already given them the gospel and they've just come to realize, yes, I'm seeing the truth this once again, what I heard before. Or they read the track, they ring a church pastor, ask questions. That's how I've seen people get saved. You know, I've seen tracks get used. They ring the church. I got this in my letterbox. And then the pastor or whoever they rang is able to give them the gospel but still it required someone that is saved spiritually to reproduce someone that is saved spiritually. It still required someone with the Holy Spirit of God in order for them to be born again by the Spirit of God. Okay? I'm not against giving out tracts. We've got the tracts, okay? But more important than that is to make sure that you reproduce, that you preach the gospel. That's how people are born again. All right? So uh, spiritually speaking, the same truth is here, okay? That everything reproduces after its own kind, all right? And if one day, and we've already done this, right? We've got a church down in Sydney. Guess why that church exists? Because this church reproduced after its own kind. We have New Life Baptist Church down in Sydney. We, this church reproduced. We've got a group of believers down there. Right now, they're probably getting ready to go soul winning, okay? There's, there's, there's great works of God going down in, in Sydney, but thanks, you know, thanks to this church, Thanks to the prayers of this church. Thanks that you guys offered this pastor to go down there and help those flo- that flock down there. You know, everything reproduces after its own kind. Verse 14. Verse 14. And God said, Let there be light in the firmament in the heaven to divide the day and the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So now God's creating the sun, the moon, and the stars. All right? Now here's an interesting thing. It says that He's putting these lights in the firmament of the heaven. Say, hold on. Is this the same heaven that the the, the birds fly in? What do you think? Now, there are some, once again, and if it's you, it's all right. You're all right with me, okay? But still, there are some that basically teach the sun, moon, and stars are in this, are are in our sky, in, in our local atmosphere, okay? And this is where you get the flat earthers. And it's really picking up pace on the internet you know, if you, if you ever get, you know, involved in those videos on YouTube, they sound pretty convincing sometimes. But some believe here that, you know, did God create? I mean, is the Bible wrong here? Is it saying the sun and the stars and the moon are actually in the same atmosphere that the birds fly? Well, keep your finger there. Turn to 2 uh, Corinthians, please. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Because we've already seen that God is a divider. We already see that He's divided in His creation, Okay. And if we know general science, we should know that the sun, stars, and the moon are not in the same atmosphere, or not, not in the same heaven where our birds fly. It's not in the, what we call the sky. But 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. This is Paul speaking, I believe, about himself. He says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one caught up to the third heaven. To the third heaven. Are there three heavens? The third heaven. So here we have someone that is caught up to the third heaven. In fact, I didn't get down everything I wanted to read. Let me just turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 
2 uh, Corinthians chapter 12. Let's keep reading verse number 3. Oh, yeah, sorry here. Verse number three. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So what does God call the third heaven here? Paradise. Paradise, okay? Now, this is, par this is where, when Jesus Christ said to the thief on the cross, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Okay, paradise is not somewhere in hell. It's not somewhere in the center of the earth. Paradise is the third heaven. Okay, this is what we got confirmation here in 2 Corinthians. So, what is the third heaven? It's, it's where God is. It's where the throne of God is. Okay, that's the third heaven. So, what's the first heaven? It's the sky. It's our atmosphere. It's where the birds fly. So, if there's a first heaven, we know that God created a heaven there, and there's a third heaven... Surely there must be a second heaven somewhere in between that. Of course there is. The second heaven is what we call outer space, or space, all right? The, the galaxies, the universe. That's where all the stars and the, and the moon and the sun is. So you see, the Bible is not contradictive. The Bible does not go against common sense, you know, and common science. No, of course not. You know, it, it, once we have the entire Bible at our disposal, we see that God is creating divisions. We see that God is creating divisions in heaven. And we see then, if, if God calls... The heaven that here resides in the third heaven, there also must be a first, there must also be a second. Hey, this is fine. This is fine with us as believers that believe in common sense science. Nothing too complicated, right? Just common sense science, and we believe the Word of God. These things are aligned. Okay? Perfect. Beautiful. I love it. Verse number uh, 20, please. Verse number 20. It says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So we covered that already. Flying in the skies. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So I just want to show you here that on this, uh, what day are we up to? The fifth day? The fourth day. The fifth day. We're up to the fifth day, sorry. That's the fifth day. So on the fifth day, we see that God creates whales or sea creatures, all the fish and birds out of what? It says out of the water, right? It says in verse 21, which the waters brought forth abundantly. Okay? So God uses water to create birds and to create sea creatures. Now, I have a theory behind this, and I'll get into that in a moment. But let's keep reading. It says in verse 22, And God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So we learn something else about God. Okay, He creates, He creates all these beautiful, amazing things, but then He gives a command. Right? What does it say? Be fruitful and multiply. Because why? Because we already saw that everything reproduces after itself. You see, God wants His creation to continue. He gives even the animals the same command that He will eventually give to man. Be fruitful and multiply. See, God wants this earth covered, okay, by living creatures. He, has, he creates animals that fly in the heaven. He creates animals that swim in the ocean. Look, neither you and I, we can't live underwater, okay? You and I, we can't live in this, we can't just fly in the sky, I, I mean, on your, of, of your own power, okay? You can't on a plane. But eventually that plane's going to come down anyway, right? We don't have those abilities, but we see every aspect of the earth, God wants it to be filled, okay? And again, this goes against everything we know that these scientists teach us. You know, the, the global warming, the overpopulation of the world. It's like God says, fill the whole earth, be fruitful, multiply, keep going, you know? But what, what, what do our schools teach us? What do our scientists teach us? This world is overpopulated. You know, we've got to really, and it's not the animals that they need to get rid of, right? It's, it's the human beings. <laughs> we'll get to the human beings in a moment. But we need to get rid of, you know, we've got too many human beings on the earth. The resources just can't cope. Look, God created the earth that it would be filled, okay, that it would be populated. Beautiful thing. Look at verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. So now we're on the sixth day. Cattle and creeping thing the, and the beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind 
the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So just on verse 24, it said, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature. So we saw in, in day number five, God creates the, the sea animals and the birds from water. But then on, on day number six, we see that God creates all the land animals from the earth. Okay? And my theory behind this, and I know it's not a perfect theory, is that it, I, I find it interesting that when you look at animals and you look at the most colorful you know, the animals that have the most color, like birds. Birds, birds are very colorful, you know. I mean, you've got a lot of sort of your average birds that are brown and black as well. But you have like a lot of parrots that have beautiful colors. You know, a lot of, uh, you know, bud uh, budgies and, and, you know, just little parrots, cockatiels, have, present a lot of color. And also fish. You know, a lot of fish are, are very colorful, very beautiful animals to look at. And I think that might have something to do with the fact that they were created out of the water, okay. But then when you look at a lot of our land animals, you know, your, your rhinos, your, you know, horses and your dogs and whatever, you, you know, cats. They're, they're not bright. You know, you, you don't see a blue cat. You know, you don't see, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, a, a red a dog. You know, you don't, you don't see these colors on these land animals. And I think it may have something to do with the fact that they were made out of the earth. And that's why a lot of our land animals, land animals have very earthly colors. But then when you see a lot of the fishes and the birds, they're very colorful. A lot of them have colors. And I think, you know, this is just my opinion. You know, I'm putting this in the Bible. But I think it might have something to do with how they were created in what they were created out of. So created out of water there. Anyway, it's not that important. But uh, let's keep reading. Verse number 26. Verse number 26. Oh, before I read 26, so I just want to show you. God desires that every aspect of the earth is populated. You know, land, sky, water. He wants it filled with animals. He wants it filled with living creatures. Verse number 26, also on day number 6. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. This is different. Okay. Did God create anything else out of his likeness, out of his image? No, this is the first time we see this. And God said, now this is very important, because look what he says. And God said, let us make man. What's us? Hold on, God. I thought you were the only one there. Well, us, because the Trinity Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, all there involved in the creation of man. And I believe this is God the Father speaking, passing on instruction to the Son who created all things. Let us make man in our image, our image. And then uh, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his, hold on, singular, his, it's all plural, our, his image. Why? Because this is the Trinity, guys. There's three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and yet they are the one God, the one true God. That's why the Bible uses singular personal pronouns, you know, and, and, and uh, 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 pronouns of plurality as well to describe the God of the Bible. This is something that's, that, again, we can't fully grasp our minds around. Okay, we understand what the Bible tells us. But once again, this is a God beyond our, our you know, putting, you know, we, we can't get something that's created and say this is like God. No, God is beyond his creation. God is three persons and yet the one God. And this, this is, you know, if you try to break it down, it's, it can be difficult. In fact, it's impossible if you try to understand every aspect of his nature. You know, it's, it's, it's the God that we worship. He's a great God. And he tells us plenty about himself in the Bible. But then the Trinity is also easy to understand. It's easy in the sense that, yeah, three persons, easy to understand. One God, easy to understand. The Bible tells me, and if I have faith in his word, if I just believe his word, it makes perfect sense. Amen. It just does, because of faith. All right? Because of faith. And uh, the Bible says there in verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. All right, so a few things I want you to notice here. Number one, once again, we're created in His image. But number two, we're the most important creation that He made. The most important creation. Why? Because it says, let them have dominion. Hey, we have authority over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle of the, all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. God has given us authority over all of the living creatures that He has created upon this earth. What does that tell you about you? You're not an animal. 
Again, this is where science, falsely so-called evolution, makes a mess of things. They say, well, you're just a hairless monkey, right? You're just an other animal. No, we're created in the image of God. We've been given dominion over all the animals. That means we're not animals. We're men and women, and God has created us for that purpose. Okay, he loves us. This is why he sent Jesus Christ to come and die for us. Jesus did not die for the animals. Okay? He did not die for the devil. He did not die for the fallen angels. He came and died for man and woman. He came to die for those that were created in the image of God. So that's why we're special in God's creation. That's why he loves us so much, because we're made after his image. But there is something, there is a word in here that I want you to pay attention to. Look at verse 26. And um, I'm sorry, ladies, if this offends you. I'm not trying to offend you, all right? And if there's a feminist here, I'm, I'm definitely going to offend you. It says there in verse 26, And God said, Let us make what? Man. Man in our image. Does it say, let us make man and woman in our image? It says man. After our likeness, all right? And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over, sorry, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. Now look at this. In the image of God created he him. Him. In what? Who's creating the image of God? Him. Man. And then he says, male and female created he them. Okay? Now, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not, what I'm not saying here is that women are not created in the image of God, in that, in that sense. In, in a, of course you are. Because if you know the story, we'll get to chapter 2 later on, is that woman came out of man, okay? But I want you to notice here is that God's very careful in the way He describes His image, okay? He's very careful. He says that it's man that was created in His image, okay? And then at the end of verse 27, it just says, male and female created He them. He doesn't mention there in His image. But in verse 27, twice created man in His own image, in the image of God created He him, okay? A masculine pronoun for the man. Now, what I'm trying to say here is, is that the Bible, the Word of God, is very careful to convey to us who God is. God is a man. God is masculine. Okay? God is masculine. And again, one problem that you're finding with Bibles, you know, some Bibles these days, is they want to make God gender neutral. Okay? Him or, he, or, or her or, or it. You know, this is a push. I don't know if it's, been hap it's happening anymore, but I remember in the early two, uh, 2000s, there was a push to change the, the, the masculine pronouns of God into sort of gender uh, neutral stuff, okay? Now we see, once again, what do we see with God? He creates divisions. He wants distinctions. And once again, when God creates man and woman, He makes a distinction between the male and the female, okay? God's not into gender neutral stuff. He wants men to be masculine. He wants women to be feminine, feminine, okay? And he wants those clear distinction between the two sexes. It's not that one is better than the other. Both complement one another to fulfill the commands that God has given us here. And if you're saying, maybe you're taking that a bit too far, keep your finger there. Turn to 1 Corinthians 11. Turn to 1 Corinthians 11. Just once again, we see this 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 6. And this is about uh, the length of hair between a man and woman. And yes, the Bible makes it clear that women ought to have long hair and that men ought to have short hair. Short hair. I haven't got time to preach all that today, but if you're interested, just read chapter 11 there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 6. For if the woman be not covered, now the covering of the woman in the context here is her hair. Her hair gives her her covering. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. All right? But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Okay, so if a woman doesn't want to be covered, Paul says, well, just, just let her shave her whole head off. But is that what he really wants? No. But if it be a shame, it is a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, then let her be covered. Okay, she should be covered with her hair. But look at verse number seven. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. So a man not, ought not to have long hair. Why? For as much as he is the image... There it is. Remember, he was made in the image of God. He is the image and glory of God. So when Jesus was walking the earth, did he have long hair? If we're made in the image of God and Jesus Christ is God, he had short hair. Okay, we're not to be covered with hair like a woman is. But then it says here, but the woman 
is the glory of the man. Okay, so let's backtrack a little bit again about the man, verse 7. For as much as he, the man, is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. The other side, once again, doesn't say that the woman is, the, is in the image of God or, or the, you know, is, is in the image of God or anything like that. We see a consistency in the Bible. You know, God wants to make it very clear that we understand that man, you're made in the image of God. God is masculine, okay? And we see, when we see the nature of God in the Bible, we're seeing masculine attributes of God, okay? And if you want to be a real man, you want to be a man after God's own heart, you want to be a man, you know, as God, as God has intended, then the best person to look at is the Lord Jesus Christ, the way that He was, the way He acted, okay? And, and, and to, to read God's words, hey, this is how God feels about certain sins, then you need to be feel about, feel about those certain sins. We see God create things. What does He want for man to do? Be productive, create, set your, your mind on something and do it, accomplish it. We see that God creates everything in six days. God, men, we're bad at this. We start projects and we don't finish it. You know? But God wants men, start your projects and finish your projects. And do a good job at it. Every time we read this, it said and it was good. Okay? Put your best you know, and your hard work behind the things that you do, men, just like God did at His creation. All right? But see, God likes distinction. God likes different purposes for different things. We see that God separated the light from the darkness. He separates the night from the day. He separates the dry land from the sea. He divides the heaven into three. And so when God created man and woman, He made them different. He made them distinct and with different purposes. And I'm so, I'm so thankful that my wife doesn't look like a man. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm so thankful she doesn't behave like a man. You know, men, when we have our Bible studies, I enjoy it. But I want to live with you my whole life. All right? I have enough of you in the Bible studies. All right? I want to get home and be with my wife. Okay? We're different. We complement one another. Okay? Women, you're the glory of the man. You know, men, we ought to glory in our wives. We need to rejoice in our wives. Be thankful that God has given us, you know, that lady, that woman, so we can live with her for the rest of our lives. We need to complement one another. Go back to Genesis 1, please. Genesis 1. Verse 28, so important that God has made distinctions between man and woman. Why? Because look at verse 28, Genesis 1, 28. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So the first commandment, the first commandment that God gives to both Adam and Eve, to man and woman, is to be fruitful and multiply. You see, the woman's not less important than a man. The only way the man can fulfill this commandment is to be with his wife. Okay? And it's a sad thing, and I guess I'll cover that later on. I'll just say it quickly, but it's a sad thing that Christians need to be told, be fruitful and multiply. You know, we've fallen into this world's overpopulation. You know, you know, have a couple, you know, a couple of kids. In fact, don't have any kids for a long time. You know, just, just live it up, go on holidays, you know, just get old, and then maybe later, you know, have kids. No, God's command is be fruitful and multiply. He wants us to have a ton of kids. God wants this earth populated, okay? God wants you to raise a godly seed. How are we going to influence the masses? Yeah, by getting people saved, be fruitful and multiply in that sense. But also physically, you know, having children, getting them to love the Word of God, the commandments of God, and, and, to, and for them to be soul winners, to go out and do the works of God. We ought to populate. We ought to have as many kids as God will give us. And uh, something else I want to just point out here is that feminism, feminism, you know, and I think feminism started around the 30s or something. And, uh, you know, the, the, the beginning of feminism was that women would have the right to vote. Because, you know, before that, only, only men voted. You know, a man would represent his family, if you will, and he would vote on behalf of his whole family. And then when feminism started, and look, am I really against women voting, giving their opinion? Not really. I'm not, you know, these things, these things, they start out, it's not a big deal, okay? And, and, and quite often as Christians, we can be fooled into thinking, well, this seems like a just cause. You know, women want more rights. But you see, that's not where it ended. That wasn't what it was all about. Just like homosexual marriage. It wasn't just about allowing uh, two men or two women to get married. It was about destroying marriage completely. That's what the whole purpose is. There's a deeper problem. There's a, there's a deeper issue behind all these things. 
you know? And then we get to second wave feminism, which is about having all, you know, being able to, to work any job like a man, you know, having all the, having all the same rights, you know, you know making, making f women feel unfulfilled in the home, making women feel unfulfilled as a mother, you know, and go, no, you, you can have a greater purpose out in the workplace. That's like second wave feminism. And now the feminism we have today, it's so weird. You know, they're against men. They're against masculinity, you know? So we have, we have women, and I'm not against women, I love women. I love my wife. I'm thankful for how God created women. I'm thankful for how God created man. It makes sense. It complements one another. Perfect, makes sense. But it's like we started with feminism over here, and I thought it was just about having more rights, to have more rights like the men. Like we're just trying to get a little closer over here. But really what I'm seeing today is it wasn't about the women. It wasn't about giving women rights. It was about taking down the man. Feminism hates masculinity. Feminism today hates men. Okay? And then they say there's a problem with man. And they call it toxic masculinity. I can't even say it anymore. Toxic masculinity. It's toxic. They say it's toxic. It's evil. It's harmful to be a man. And so what do we see today? We see men, instead of being God, godly men like the Bible tells us, they become soft. They become more feminine. And you know, to be effeminate as a man is a sin. Okay, I'm not saying they're homosexual, but you become effeminate. You, you don't, you don't, you don't uh, take responsibility anymore for your family. You know, you don't work hard anymore. You know, you decide, well, I'm just going to send my wife to work. Why do I have to work hard? You know, I'm going to send my wife to work to, you know, to provide. No, God has created man. Just like he is the creator of all things, he wants us to work hard for our families. He wants us to take responsibility for our families. You know, if it was just about women having more rights, I'd be like, that's, well, I mean, you should get married anyway. You have all the rights you can have with your husband. You know, but the thing is, they're trying to take down what it means to be a man. They want to blend the, the genders. They want to make no difference between man and woman. But you see, the problem with fem, um, feminism today, it's not that they hate men. In fact, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to create a battle between the sexes. You know, you know, women, you know, you've been enslaved by men for too long, you know. And men, you need to make sure you stop enslaving women, you know. You need to make sure that, you know, you know get in touch with your feminine side, you know. You know, learn to be a little softer, you know. No, 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 no. The problem with feminism is they're not against men. Well, yes, that's what they, that's what they portray. But they're actually against God. Okay, because God created man in his image. You know, God created us that we would work hard, that we would be masculine. He created division. He created distinction between men and women so we can be fruitful and multiply. So women can rejoice, you know, to be under, uh, you know, being looked after by a man, to be provided. I mean, this is, this is royal. It's like royalty, right? You get provided by a man. A man loves you. He wants to give you security. You know, it, it's inbuilt in a man to want to look after a woman, you know, to give her everything she needs in life to provide for her, to open her, the door for her, to open the car door for her. That's seen as offensive these days. What in the world? That's, that's, that's me saying, you're glorious, you're beautiful, I love you. That's, that's signs of affection, okay? God's done things on, a, on look, God's way is the best way. God's way is always the best way. If you want to have joy and satisfaction in your life, women stay feminine, men stay masculine, find a husband and wife, and live, you know, a, 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 uh, a life that God wants you to live. You know, be fruitful and multiply. Have your children. Find joy in your children. That's where you're going to find the ultimate joy in life. Honestly. Honestly, it's not your career. It's not your friends. It's your family unit. That's where you're going to find joy. Okay? If you're lacking joy there, you need to work hard. You need to work hard. It's what God wanted for us. Verse 29. And God said... Behold, I have given you, the man and woman, given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, of all the earth, and every tree. So not just the animals. He's saying, I'm giving you all the trees. I'm giving you all the fruits, all the seeds here. In the which is the fruit of the tree, you in seed. To you it shall be for meat. That's for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. So God has given us vegetation, fruits, veggies, you know, herbs, seeds for us to sustain our lives. You know, Adam and Eve and all the animals here, they were ve all vegetarian, okay, all vegetarian. They were all eating every green herb and, and every meat. 
the question gets asked, well, if, if Adam and Eve were vegetarian back then, that's how God intended it, shouldn't we be vegetarian today? Now, first of all, let me say this. I do believe, I do believe that we don't eat enough of what the earth produces. You know, I, I do believe that a lot of our diseases and sicknesses uh, can be taken care of by eating better, you know, eating more seeds, you know. Um, we eat today a lot of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, sorry? Processed, that's the word I'm looking for. We, we eat today a lot of processed foods, okay? And through that, that pro, you know, um, when, when foods get processed, it loses a lot, a lot of its nutrients. You know, and it's good to learn to eat, you know, eat your veggies, kids. You know, mum and dad tell you to eat your veggies. I'm telling you, eat your veggies. God created them so you can sustain yourselves, okay? But does that mean that's all we should eat? I'll tell you why we're not vegetarian today. Go to chapter 9, please. Genesis chapter 9. Actually, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. This is after Adam and Eve sinned. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Did you know the earth today that we eat from is cursed? The earth is cursed today. It's not just man and woman, you know, because of our sin, but the entire earth was cursed when man fell. Okay, so the plants and, and, and the veggies, the fruits and the seeds that you eat today do not have the same nutritional you know, power that it had back, back then with Adam and Eve. It doesn't have everything that you need to sustain life. It's not going to give you everything you need to overcome every sickness and, and uh, you know, uh, problems that might come in your health. Go to Genesis 9 verse 3, please. Genesis 9 verse 3. Genesis 9 verse 3. So we saw that God commanded Adam and Eve to eat, you know, of every, every tree and seed and, and so forth. But look at Genesis 9.3. This is after the flood. It says, Jesus, God saying to, um, to Noah, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Every moving thing. Yeah, that includes snakes. I mean, I'm not going to eat a snake, but you know, it's moving. Anything that moves, right? Any animal, any creature shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb I have given you, all things okay even as the green herb have i given you all things so even as god commanded adam and eve to to be vegetarian to eat that was a command of god he then commands noah you also to, uh, to eat of the things that move of the animals of the creatures okay because ultimately to get you know to be completely healthy you've got to mix your greens and your fruits with meat as well okay please don't get into this fad of being you know strictly vegetarian or strictly vegan now, I'm not saying there might be times when you might need to do that because of health reasons, to lose a bit of weight or whatever. I, I, I'm all for that. But that shouldn't be your way of life, okay? You should be someone that is balanced, that has a balanced diet of, of veggies, fruits, and also the meats, the moving things that God has given us. So things have changed for us today. We live on a cursed earth, okay? So obviously, the produce that comes out of this earth is not going to be, be as, as beneficial for us as it was in, in the days of Adam and Eve. And then once it all gets processed, all these modifications made to seeds that are done today, I won't go into all that today, even less nutrients than, than what, you know, if you just grew out of your own ground. Verse 31, please, Genesis 1, 31. Almost done here. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now it says everything was, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So God creates everything in six days. The heavens, the earth, all the animals, all the plants, man and woman, and he says it was very good, you know, fantastic. I love it. I love it that God creates all things, says it's very good. Let me say this to you, just very quickly, because some people think that uh, the devil, that Satan fell during these six days. Maybe on day number one, after God created heaven, that's when Satan fell, and, you know, then, then there was this massive rebellion in heaven, and all this stuff is going on. Do you think that's true? If God can see heaven and earth, everything that he's created, he goes, man, this is very good. Do you think there was this massive rebellion going on in heaven with Satan, you know, taking, taking a third of the angels with him or something like that? No, okay? This is not when Satan, the six days, no one's rebelling against the Lord. Everything is very good. There is no sin at this point in time, okay? It is 
perfect. And I want to cover a couple of things before we wrap up here. Just very quickly. Um, there are two um, teachings that come with creation, or Genesis 1, um, that are, that's just false teaching. Okay? Number one, it's the day-age theory. The day-age theory. And the idea behind that is, instead of God creating everything in six literal 24-hour days, that he create, every day represents a time period. You know, maybe a day represents a thousand years or, or a day here represents a million years or a billion years. Why do you think they want to do that? Why do you think you, some people want to say, well, maybe a day represents a billion years? Because of evolution. You've already seen how stupid evolution is. Do you want to take something so stupid and put it into the pure, perfect Word of God? No way. Okay? I mean, you, you've got so many problems by doing that. And I don't want to go through all of that today. I don't want to fill your minds. I, I want you to rejoice in God's creation. I don't want to right now fill your minds with all the nonsense that people come up with. Okay? But that, that's one way people try to fit evolution into the Bible. Another way people try to fit evolution into the Bible is by creating a, a, a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2. So it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Then they believe between verses 1 and 2, there's, there's this massive gap of millions of years. Okay? And then in verse 2, and in that millions of years, there was this big rebellion against, uh, of Satan and, and or some pre-Adamic race, and then God destroyed that earth. And that's why in verse number 2, it says, the earth was without form and void and darkness. And so, see, the earth looks like it's been destroyed. You know, so we've gone through this period of verse, verse 1, verse 2, millions of years there. Again, what are, and the dinosaurs probably lived during that time as well, they'll teach. What are they trying to do? Again, they're, tr they're trying to take evolution, okay, and stick it into the Bible, okay? Now, I'm not going to go through all of that. I'm not going to give you every verse why they're all... I mean, I, I could go... I could preach entire sermons against these things, but I don't want to. All I want you to do is turn to Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, okay? Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, which I think in 2017 I gave it to you as a memory verse. So if you remember it, this is the best one to combat this nonsense. Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. The Bible says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. In six days. Okay? He made heaven and earth. What did God create there in verse number one? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So do you think there's a huge gap of millions of years then until verse two? No, it says in six... Heaven and earth were created in that six, those six days. But look at this. The sea and all that in them is and rest of the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So I want you to notice there. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is. All that in them is. Okay? So did God create heaven with angels for billions of years, and then those angels rebelled somehow on the earth, and then billions of years, and then, and then he creates man and woman and all these other things. No. In six days, everything that was created in heaven, in earth, in the sea, the animals, everything was created here in six days. There's, there's the verse. It destroys all these other theories. All these other theories that's trying to add millions of years, add an evolution to the Bible. It's nonsense. The Exodus 20 verse 11 confirms, we don't need confirmation, just read Genesis 1, makes perfect sense. God created all things in six days. But once again, it just confirms the truth of what Genesis 1 is speaking about. Okay? So please don't, and, and I'm telling you this because I once got caught up in the gap theory. I once started to believe, because back in the um, late 90s, I started to sort of come around to the King James Bible. I was really excited. The internet was kind of new. I was just King James Bible teaching. You know, just what, I, I type into the searches on Yahoo back then, right? King James Bible teaching. I came across a website, you know, it's King James, it was teaching the gap theory. It was like, oh wow, this is something new. And I remember going to my brother, going, you know, to my, and my brother's not really into the Bible or anything like that, but I went to my brother and saying, oh, did you know there's a huge gap between Genesis 1 1 and 1 2? And he goes, Kevin, you're an idiot. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, I am an idiot. <laughs> I woke up, I just needed those words. I just needed someone with clarity and common sense to go, where does the Bible say that, you know? Of course, okay, so I'll leave it there. Um, if you have any questions about for me after the service, please ask. Um, let's just end in a word of prayer.